To today's topic is uh, fairly straightforward, uh, not not some abstract, not, nothing mystical about that for those who are new to Buddhism. Uh, the, the topic is, is actually called how to deal with a fault-finding mind. Uh, they are act actually subtitled as lessons from the Dhammapada verses 252 and 253. So for those who are new or, f or fairly new, you'll be wondering what is this Dhammapada, right? The word Dhammapada is actually one of the many Buddhist scriptures, right? Uh, unlike, say, religions like Christianity or Islam or even Judaism, which has got one holy book, we don't really have one holy book, right? like the Bible or the Quran, but we do have actually quite a number of uh, scriptures. And one of the most common or most popular is actually called the Dhammapada, uh, which translated into English it means like the, the way of the truth. If you use the word Dhamma as the truth, all right? or pada like the way, okay, or the path. So if you look at the word Dhammapada, so it is actually a compilation of uh, verses. Uh, altogether, there are about, there are altogether 423 verses. So today we're looking at verse 252 and 253. But actually, you have uh, 423 uh, verses uh, separated into like 26 chapters, okay? Now, as you also know, there are also uh, different schools of Buddhism. All right, so different schools of Buddhism also have their own Dhammapada. And the teachings are very much similar. You, the one that I'm referring to is what we call the Pali, uh, the Pali tradition. That, that means the form of Buddhism that is practiced in, uh, in Thailand, in Burma, or Myanmar, in Cambodia, in Laos, Sri Lanka. Right, so we call it the Pali, P-A-L-I. Not Bali, yeah? Pali. Okay? But of course, you also have got other Dhammapada. You've got the Sanskrit Dhammapada, and recently you may have read that uh, there's some discoveries. They found that there's also Buddhist scriptures written in the Gandhari script. Right? Gandhara, Gandhari being from the region in Pakistan, in Gandhara. So they also found a lot of Buddhist scriptures there, right? Lately. Uh, well, lately means maybe a couple of 10, 20 years, all right? By this British, uh, rather American, I think, uh, uh, you know, Richard Solomon, right? So, but when you study all those scriptures, whether it's in the Pali or in the Gandhari, or they say in the Savastivada, so there are different schools of Buddhism, they're actually all very similar. All right, so which points to one, to one very important point, which is that the teachings of the Buddha for the past 2,600 years, whichever tradition that you want to follow, whether you follow the uh, like Pali tradition, which is found in Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, or you follow the Tibetan tradition, or you follow the Chinese tradition, the essence or the key teachings of the Buddha are very much the same. A good example is this verse here, verse 252 and 253. It's about faults, about faults, yeah? And um, of course, this is from the Pali Dhammapada. One of the first teachings which I heard when I was a student, all right, uh, was actually... Uh, a teaching by the late Master Shuan Hua. Some of you know Master Shuan Hua from the city of 10,000 Buddhas in North, in North America. So he, one of the things that I remember when I was a student, he says that easily seen are the faults of others. Hard indeed are, are one's own fault. All right? So that's coming from a Chinese uh, Mahayana teacher. Okay? And towards the end of this talk, I'll show you that also from the Tibetan tradition, this is a very important uh, teaching also about faults, about finding faults. So here it says that uh, easily seen are others' faults. Hard indeed to see are one's own. Like shaft one we knows others' fault. Shaft, you know, like the one, sorry. Uh, but one's own faults, okay, one's own fault, one hikes as a crafty fowler or a hunter. All right, conceals himself by camouflage. So the hunter trying to hunt some birds, so he, he camouflages himself. Okay, so this is verse 252. All right, so there's a lot of deep meaning behind it. So today we, we're going to explore what the Buddha meant when he said this, and how in the field of modern science, particularly neuroscience, why is it that we always have this fault-finding mind? All right? The Buddha told us this 2,600 years ago. But today, interestingly, especially with the field of neuroscience, you find that that's the reason why that is happening. All right? But more important is, rather than just have an inquisitive mind, why it happens to us, how can we overcome it? How can we overcome this fault-finding mind? All right? 
Because from the Buddhist perspective, when you continuously have a fault finding mind, it basically means that if you continuously find faults with other people, do you have happiness in yourself? Do you make yourself happy? Not necessarily. All right? You actually make yourself very unhappy for different reasons. So thanks to neuroscience, it actually explains many of what the Buddha has actually taught us 2,600 years ago today. So we'll look at some of those things and towards the end, we'll see what is the, uh, some alternative or some solutions that we could take so that we could reduce if we can't, if we can't completely eradicate our fault-finding mind, we can at least dilute it. All right? Just like in Buddhism, we talk about anger. All right? Maybe you're not able to completely overcome your anger, but surely you can reduce, uh, minimize, all right? or sub-optimize right, your anger, all right? so that you become a much more happier uh, person. So that's the whole purpose of the Buddha's teachings. All right? okay? So let's look at it. So this is just verse 252. So here is just a statement. Easily seen are others' faults. In other words, we can see other people have got so many problems, so many faults. But we never talk about our own fault. We always look at other people's fault. Right? And like Shaf, one we knows others' faults. So Shaf, you know, we know that when you, when you try to like, you harvest, you know, let's say uh, paddy, right? you harvest, so you throw all, all over the place. And, uh, but one's own fault, one height. So when it comes to your, our own fault, we try not to let people know, right? Would you, would, would you, for example, wake up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to tell my neighbor what are my faults. <laughs> You're not going to, to do that, right? So that's a, that's a reason behind it. And then the next verse in Dhammapada 253, the Buddha says, He who sees others' faults and is ever irritable, all right, the corruptions of such a one grow. He is far from the destruction of corruptions. Now this is... Uh, you know, sometimes the translations, right? The, the, the Pali word here is asava, the word, the word corruptions, right? Mm, is, uh, I'm not going to spend the next 40 minutes talking to you about asavas, right? So that's, that's a very uh, difficult word to translate, but it's been translated in different ways. Uh, this translation here, I think Buddha Rakita, so translated as uh, corruptions. Uh, sometimes the word asavas can be translated as cankers or simple word defilements. Right. What are these defilements? Like greed, like hatred, like anger, like delusion. So we have many, many uh, defilements in our mind. Right? The aim of Buddhism is not to say that you are a bad person because you have all these defilements, because we all have all those defilements. But to understand the nature of these defilements, to understand the nature of greed, to understand the nature of anger, to understand the nature of delusion, and to ask ourselves, are they useful to us? Are they wholesome? Are they good? If they are no good, do we want, do we want them in our mind? No, we don't. So the Buddha says then there's a way how you could actually get rid, reduce and get rid of all these defilements. So in this text here, it's translated as corruptions. Right? So those of you who are familiar with basic Pali, the word is asava, A-S-A-V-A. Okay? Uh, in the second discourse of the Buddha, in, the, in another text called the Middle Length Sayings, the Majjhima Nikaya, there's a discourse or there's a sermon. The name of that sermon is called Sabha Sutta, the All. The All, right? Sabha means All, so the Sabha Sutta. So in that Sutta or in that discourse, the Buddha says, why do we have so many problems? Why do we have so much anxieties? Why do we have so many worries? That's because we do not think, we do not see things in a proper way. All right? we, don't, we don't see things in a proper way. But if you see things in a proper way, you understand things in a proper way, your anxieties, your troubles, your difficulties, eventually will diminish and disappear. All right? The Buddha used the word yoniso manasekara. Uh, so those of you who have been here long, all right, so you know did this word. For those who are new, don't, don't, don't worry. We are not here to speak to you in Hindi or Pali or, or Tamil. Right? Just, just bear with me some of those words because uh, for those who are more, more seasoned, you know, so you may wonder what is the word that I'm referring to. Right? So the word that the Buddha used in the text is Yoniso Manasekra. Right? The word manas, Manasekra from the word Mana. You know the Malay language, actually comes from 
uh, Sanskrit, right? From Indian language, right? So in as much as whether you want to call yourself you know, real Malay or real Indian, you know, you, our ancestry is all actually from India. <laughs> our language itself is from India. So the word manasekara from the word mano. Mano means the mind. The, the mind. That's why you have the Malay word manusia, isn't it? You know what the word manusia means? Manu. That means someone with a mind. We all have minds. <laughs> we all have minds. So we are manusia. Right? So we are Matnusia. So that's a Matnusia is not a Malay word, it's, it's actually a uh, Malay word. In fact, in the Pali, in Pali the, the text is Manusa. M A N U S A, Manusa. Right? So he says that one of the, uh, the, the greatest blessings is to be born as a Manusa, precious human birth. As a Matnusia, right? as we say in Malay. Okay, so the corruptions means all those de defilements. Right? So we, we have all those de de defilements. So rather than to think of ourselves as we are a bad person, but to understand the nature of, of all these corruptions and uh, how do we then overcome them? How do we uh, eventually uproot them? And that's where the meditation comes in. Right? For those of you who have done meditation, uh, then you realize that the purpose of meditation is not just for you to have peace of mind, <laughs> while that is a byproduct. Neither is it just for you to develop some psychic powers so you can eavesdrop on what your neighbour is saying right? or know what your husband is doing when he's not at home. <laughs> it's not so much to develop those kind of psychic abilities. Even though in Buddhism we say that those who are highly trained meditators, they actually have those, those powers. Yeah? But that's not the aim. Those, those, uh, those so-called psychic powers are actually the byproducts, the result of the practice. Okay, can you follow that? So I don't want you to get the wrong impression, yeah? So, so he who sees other faults is always irritable, always upset, isn't it? When, when, you, when you talk to, to, to your colleague, when you talk to your friend, or maybe you talk to your spouse about somebody else, all right? About some of the, the faults that, that you say, are you happy saying that? No, you're, you're not happy, you're irritated. And he said, why, why, why does he always do, do, do that? When you're irritated, who is happy? Are you happy? You're not ha happy. The, does the guy that you've been talking, you've been bad-mouthing, does he know you're talking? He may not know. He's happily, you know, um, enjoying his roti chanai on a Saturday morning, pro pro probably. But you are so upset here, you know. Okay, so, so then you have no well-being. You have no well, no well, well-being. So Buddhism is actually about, about personal growth, about personal development. Right? How do you develop yourself? So here he says it's far from the destruction of corruption. So this is just two verses, okay? So let's, let's go on to something more contemporary, right? This is, the Buddha spoke about this 2,600 years ago. Let's see how does this hold true today, all right? So why find faults, <laughs> all right? This is some research that has been done. Negative events have a greater impact on our brains than positive ones, all right? That's not my discovery, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm no clinical psychologist, all right? This is a research done by many, uh, many clinical psychologists. And one of them, which I'll share with you later, his name is Rick Hansen, Dr. Rick Han Hansen from uh, UC Berkeley. Right? Now, thank you. Rick Hansen says that, you know, it's our nat nature of our mind is such that we always look for uh, bad things. We, we look for negative things. We look for what is bad. Right? That is why in Buddhism, we also say the Buddhist path is like going upstream. You know? It's like going upstream. You know, water flows downstream. <laughs> Imagine going upstream. So what, one of the things that Rick Hansen says is that going up, uh, that, 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 we, that our human propensity is always to look for the negative. Right? To look for the negative. Right? And then secondly, once we have found the negative, once we find that something is bad, somebody's fault, for example, what do we do? We focus on it. Right? We focus on it. So once you focus on it, you overreact to it. <laughs> you all react to it, right? And some of you who are doing vipassana, you, you know that the, the, if, if you are a good practitioner, after some practice, instead of learning to react, you don't react, you respond. So from a psychological point of view, there's a difference. When, you, when, when somebody ang makes you angry, our immediate reaction is we react, there's a reaction. But if you are a trained uh, you have uh, trained your mind, you're able to respond. In other words, there's a very tiny gap there. 
So in other words, before you punch him, right, because he said something nasty to, to you, you don't react, right? So you respond. You know, there's a, there's a little gap there. That's how meditation helps us. Right? But what Rick Hansen is saying is that there are, there are five, five things, right? The first one, we, we look for bad things. Right? Secondly, we, uh, we, we, we react to it, right? We, you know, sorry, we focus on it. So once you focus on it, you react. Once you react, what you do is you remember it. You continuously remember it. Then he said, that person, I'll never forgive him. The next 10 lives, I'll come back and, and go after him. All right? So what happens if you continually to do that? And you create habits. You form habits. It becomes habitual. And you'll be, interest, you'll be interested to know that the Buddha actually even have a word for, for this Nepali language. And the word is anusaya. It means we form those tendencies. We form those, those uh, underlying tendencies in our mind. Now, do we want to form those tendencies? We do not want. All right? so, so we always have this propensity to look for things that is negative. We, look, we like to, when you look at someone, you try to, when, when you see your neighbor suddenly driving a brand new uh, car, you know, maybe, maybe brand new, uh, now BM, Mercedes, no, no longer the Maserati, maybe. <laughs> now everybody gets have a BM, they have a Mercedes, right? So it's no big deal now. So when you drive a Maserati, you know, then we say, oh, probably, you know, this must be drug money. I always see him going to Myanmar, you know, so. But actually, he went to Myanmar to do meditation, you know, but this guy said, you know, he's got drug money. So, our immediate reaction, right or not? Do we ever have said, when you see our, our, our neighbor driving a brand new car, do we say, wow, you know, he, you know, he must, uh, he's married, you know, he must have got fantastic marriage, he must have done something good, his business will be prospering. We always like to think about that. Or if we see someone from another ethnic group, very rich, you say, ah, oh, must be corruption, really. And I think many of us, you know, we always like to think that, isn't it? Why? Why? It's because the nature of our mind, propensity of our mind. But if you are trained in meditation, then you, you don't react in that manner. You respond. Because you do not know. You really do not know, isn't it? So why form that kind of opinion? So that's very important. So Buddhism is about mind training. It's about how we transform our mind. And that's basically it. All right? His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. In fact, all these teachings, he always talks about the purpose of Buddhism is how do we transform our minds? How do we transform our negative emotions into positive emotions? Basically, how do we, how do we uh, transform what we call corruptions? You know, early on, the, the, the words. Because if you can do that, then you, you reduce your fault-finding mind. Okay? So here it says, many experts view this predisposition as an evolutionary survival mechanism. Yeah? It was more important to remember where a predator was hiding than to recall something pleasant. <laughs> right? You know, I think there's some stories about the zebra, you know. Right? I think Achana Maro also gave, gave that, that simile in one of his talks. Uh, so, it's, it's part of evolutionary uh, psychology. Right? So that is why Today, you find that uh, there, are, there are different groups of, uh, especially Westerners, who are interested in Buddhism, and most of them tend tends to be highly educated uh, psychologists or, or mind or, or neuroscientists, you know. And uh, like uh, Robert Wright, some of you have, have heard of Robert Wright, Dr. Robert Wright, who wrote the book Why Buddhism is True, right, which became a kind of a New York Times bestseller. Now, Robert Wright is not your your, you know, your puja kind of Buddhist who, 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 who sit down and do chanting. But he does meditation and he found that one of the things he found out that because of this evolutionary bi biology that actually the Buddha was so, was so correct about how we react to, to, you know, to suffering and so on. So a lot of these people here. So it was more important to remember where a predator was hiding than to recall something pleasant. Imagine the, in the, the caveman, what was his main concern? To the caveman, do you think he got time to sit and meditate and you know, radiate loving kindness? Probably not. <laughs> All right. Most of his time is to spend trying to, to uh, you know, what, what he called it, uh, find his next, next meal, isn't it? So that's why, that's why he says that precious human life. In the Tibetan tradition, uh, it says that there are 10 benefits of a precious human life. And one of the benefits is our ability to be able to, for example, appreciate and get the opportunity to listen to Dhamma. 
I think all of us have the opportunity now. We are here, we are able to listen to the Dhamma. But we have many other people out there, even in Malaysia, who may want to come to listen to a Dhamma at this time, but they can't. They got to work, they got to, to you know, maybe earn a living. Otherwise, there's no food for, 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 for dinner. There are many people who are like, like that. All right? So we count ourselves very fortunate in, in that sense. Okay? So having said that, um, in, the, in the early days, you know, people may not have that opportunity. So today, we, we have. I think Gandhi used, used to say, if a person is, uh, has not been, have not eaten for many days, you know, and then, and then you ask him, come, listen to Dhamma talk. I'm going to talk to you about the Four Noble Truths. I'm going to talk to you how many thought moments make one thought process. I want to teach you how to attain jhanas. Gandhi said, it's more important you give him a loaf of bread. Let him have his meal first. So there are certain basic uh, necessities we need to, to take care of. Right? So let's not be too evangelical right? in that sense. Okay, let's, let's look at the next one. Okay, let the positive stick. Now, Rick Hansen also talked about what is called the mind is like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive. You know what is Velcro and Teflon? I think the ladies should, should know, right? Not about the men, right? Velcro, you know, like, you know, some of the shoes, right? You got the Velcro grip, isn't it? Grip. Teflon, uh, I... I, I know when I have to fry eggs, you know, then I use the non-stick pan. Right? So it's so much easier, right? So that's Teflon, isn't it? Am I right? <laughs> right, okay. All right, so Vacro and Teflon. So Vacro, so whatever is negative, it sticks very easily. That's the nature of our, of, of our mind. That's the nature of our mind. But when it comes to positive things, it's like Teflon. It just, it just goes off. It doesn't stick. It doesn't stick. And what is the aim of Buddhist practice? Why are we here today trying to listen to the Dhamma talks? So that we can change whatever is good, like Velcro, so we can stick to that. So that whatever is no good, it just washes it away. <laughs> so that's the whole purpose. And I, and I like this expression from Rick, right? He said, to help overcome our negativ negativity bias. Well, we have this bias been ne negative, right? Uh, we should turn a fleeting positive event like a compliment that hardly registered or an act of kindness that was barely acknowledged into an impactful positive experience that sticks like your vacro, right? By taking the time to remember and relish it for 10 to 30 seconds. Right? So this is his method. Now, Rick Hansen is a, well, he's, he, he also, he, he's, a, he's a psychologist, he's a clinical psychologist, but he also claimed to be a practicing Buddhist. So he actually teaches meditation at the Vajrapani Institute in North America. And uh, so he considered himself, uh, you know, a Buddhist pra practitioner in, in that sense. So he, he, he found the Buddha's teachings really useful in his, uh, in, in, in his life, right? All right, to have well-being, okay? So remember this statement, though, our mind is like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. Okay, so I'm not going to talk any more about Rick Hansen, but if you want to know more about what he said, this book called The Buddha's Brain. Interesting, right? Have you heard of this book before? Anyone have heard of this? Anyone? No? You only heard of your... <laughs> you never heard of The Buddha's Brain. <laughs> so he wrote this book called The Buddha's Brain, but it's uh, not a very recent book. I think it's like 2009. 2009. So he, what he's saying is that The Buddha's Brain is the reverse of most people are. But the, Buddha, the Buddha said that we can be like him. Uh, that's, that's the challenge. We can be like the Buddha. No other religious teacher in this world have ever said that you can be like the founder of that religion. Anyone? <laughs> Except the Buddha. The Buddha said you can be like me. You can be like the Buddha. So that is why in some of the Buddhist traditions, like in the Mahayana, in the Tibetan tradition, their aspiration is to be a Buddha. So that they become the, the Buddha. When you become like the Buddha, that means your mind, your Velcro will be for those that is wholesome, that is good, that is, uh, you know, that is skillful, and will be a Teflon for those that is unskillful, negative. Right? So later we'll see what, what are those that in the Buddhist teachings. So this is the Buddha's brain. It's about happiness, love, and wisdom. So after writing this book, it became such a popular book, uh, not only among Buddhists, because, you know, this is like, also like a self-help. It's like a self-help book, right? 
So he wrote another book called Neurodharma. <laughs> neuro, you know, neuro like neuroplasticity, neuro as in the mind, neuro. So Neurodharma, right? You can read that book or two, okay? But I'm not here to promote this book. I, I'm not his. I'm not his his his, his publicist, <laughs> right? He he could be one of those. You know, I think the other day. Victor, Elaine, we were, talk, we were talking about having the Global Buddhist Conference. So we think of some of the speakers, so maybe someone like Rick, you know, we'd be good. He, 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 he travelled a lot. He, he was in, in Australia. He, 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 he spoke at many sessions for the Buddhist groups there on, on psychology and well-being, basically talking about well-being. Okay? okay, so just very quickly for most of us each day, just, just to give a summary of this. Our moments in life are either neutral or positive a lot of time. The problem is these moments get remembered with standard memory systems, which is to say they're mostly in and out, right? But negative experiences are instantly registered and intensely focused on based on the negativity basis of the mind. So we always start with how to get rid of the negative. One. That is why you look at the Buddha's teachings, you, you, you find that the famous saying, this is the teaching of all Buddhas. What is this teaching? This is the teaching of all Buddhas. What is the first one? Huh? Do, no, no, no. Not starting with do good. <laughs> Avoid evil. <laughs> do good. Purify the mind. And there's a reason why we start with avoiding evil. Or, start, or avoid what is negative. And there's a reason. So if you understand this now, because the nature of our mind is such. So you start with trying to get rid of what is unwholesome. Then you, posit you cultivate good. If you do the other way around, then you, you, you find that you may, you may have some hiccups along the way. So I think the, the, the Buddha was very precise in his uh, instructions. Right? And you, you find not only this statement, avoid evil, do good, purify them, but subsequently when I, when I show, show you the next, like right efforts, the four right efforts. You see, there are two pairs, right? And you find that Buddha again start with what is deemed as negative, but negative in that sense that uh, what we should not have. What do we do with that? So there's a reason behind. So as I said, there's always a, a reason behind what the, what the Buddha has, has, has given us. There's a reason, okay? So, uh, okay, let's go on. Okay, I, implicit memories or memories get shaded in a darker and darker way by the slowly accumulating residue of negative experiences. To counteract that, we need to actively build up positive implicit memories to balance this unfair accumulation of negative implicit memories. Now, the Buddhist approach is, as you, all of you know, one of the most important practices is mindfulness, isn't it? All of you know, know that. Even if you are not a Buddhist, you find that this word mindfulness is so common, all right? Uh, even 20 years ago, when I, when, I, when I remember when I first joined one of the, 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 the banks, I was working for one of the banks, the first thing my CEO told me, and he, well, I'm not sure if even if he's a Buddhist, but I know that the wife was very active in Kuan Yin Ting, but I don't think he's a Buddhist. First thing he told me, he said, you know, you know first thing for our bank to grow, we have to be very mindful. <laughs> first thing he told me that. So the first thing I heard, I said, wow. I said, I said, uh, I said, you know, Doc, Dr. Lin, I said, you, 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 you must be a... In my mind, I said, probably Dr. Lin is a, is a Buddhist master, practice meditation. But actually, I realized that he, he doesn't know much about Buddhism. <laughs> but mindfulness, it was in vogue, as, as they say, you know, in vogue. Right? But he was a very smart man. He was our, our country's uh, first uh, chartered statistician, you know, got a PhD from Harvard, you know, and he rose up to be the... I think the, the, the highest non-Malay in the central bank or something like that. Okay. All right. So he was a very smart guy, but first thing he told me is be mindful huh? <laughs> before our bank can grow. <laughs> right. Okay. So steps to being positive. All right. So this is where we come. Everything in, in, in the Dharma, in Buddhism, when you, you study, it's not just for theory. It's not just for theory. Right? Everything has got an application to, towards it. All right. That's why the late Thich Nhat Han, he has got a center called um, applied Buddhist Research Institute or, or, some, or Buddhist Research, applied, applied Buddhist Research. So in other words, whatever research that we study, whatever teachings that we know, we must be able to apply in our everyday life. Okay? Everyday life. That's very important. So the first step is, so there are three, three steps here. Huh? First step is you turn positive events into positive, 
sorry, that's a typo error. So you should turn negative events into positive experiences, right? All right. So I'm, I was trying to be too positive, so even I, I got it wrong. <laughs> it should be you turn or you transform uh, negative events into positive experiences. Now, this word experiences, our five aggregates in Buddhism, we talk about the five khandhas, the five aggregates. Our feelings, our thought process, our consciousness, you know. All those things are what? Our experiences, isn't it? It's all ex experiences, okay? When you feel, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, it is, it is, it is an experience. Our sankharas, you know, our, our, our sanya, you know, our perception, when you, whether you perceive some, something, you know, so all those things are just our experiences, okay? So we turn negative events into positive uh, experiences. So in some tradition, like in the Tibetan tra tradition, they call it mind training. Uh, in fact, they, they, have a, they, they have a very elaborate process of training, they call it lojong. I think Ile knows, right? Lojong, right? Lojong means a mind training, right? Like, you know, eight verses on transforming the mind, or you know, seven practices to transform the mind. Right? So all these are called mind training practices. And the purpose is for us to transform our negative, our unwholesome, unskillful thoughts into wholesome, skillful thoughts. Remember I said the word anusaya, remember? Habits. So how do we cultivate those positive habits? So that's the first thing we, we need to understand. Secondly is we relish the positive experiences. All right? So we relish means we try to sustain whatever is wholesome, whatever is skillful. Okay? And finally, we internalize the positive experiences. All right? So it is said, for example, this morning we all had to recite the five precepts. Isn't it? We, why? Because we need to remind our, 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 our ourselves. All right? So that we have that, so that every time we want to do something, we have this memory that oh, we should follow our five precepts. Isn't it so? And you, you know the word mindfulness from the Pali word sati or smriti in Sanskrit. No? Pali is sati. You know what it means actually? To what is the verb there? To remember. To remember. To remember what? To remember your nasty neighbor or to remember to remember the, the good things. What is what is wholesome? What is skillful? And how do we remember that? It starts with right views, right understanding. That is why the Noble Eightfold Path starts with right understanding. Right? As I think many great teachers would have said, you know, you may be an expert meditator, you may be able to sit for hours, but you don't have right understanding, you don't have right views, that's not going to help you eventually. Right? You may build fantastic concentration, all right? but the concentration must be balanced with mindfulness. And mindfulness must be balanced with efforts, isn't it? You know, in the Satipatthana Sutta, there are a couple of, of things. One is effort, isn't it? Efforts, okay? The other one is uh, clear comprehension. And the third one is mindfulness. Satima, Satima Sampajana, right? Okay? So, and you must have all, all those things there. So, let's, let's look at what are these. So again, this is a kind of a practical guide here. Okay, so a good person. So uh, b b before that, I just want to, to give you uh, one or two slides where the Buddha explains in some of the discourses who or, who or what constitutes a good person. And you'll find this is very similar to what I discussed early on. He says, when asked, does not reveal another person's weak points. Right? To say nothing of when unasked. <laughs> If pressed with questions, he speaks of another person's weak points, not in full. <laughs> Can you follow this? When he's not asked, when he's not asked, right? The first one, and when somebody asks him, right? Now, this when, when he's not asked, he reveals another person's good points. To say nothing of when asked. So what more if you ask him, he said that guy's good good points. So. So whenever you talk to him, he, he likes to say the good points about the other, the other person. So when he's not asked, he still talk about the other person's good points. He tries to find what are the, 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 the good points. If pressed with question, he speaks of another person's good points in full. <laughs> right? So I think we can actually try this. You know, in when we, you know, all of us work, right? 
Uh, I don't think anyone is a full-time yogi. Any full-time yogi or <laughs> anyone who is a monk or nun, nun, right? So we all work. We all have, have uh, responsibilities. We all have, have a career. When we meet people, it's very naturally that you find one or two person would like to, you know, suddenly, you know, we talk, somebody will talk bad about this Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so. Oh, you know, blah, 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 this morning. I said. So what is our, how do we respond? If you react, it's, yeah, I know, I know, I agree with you. Then you add, add fuel to the fire. Uh, you add fuel to the fire. If you respond means you listen. Why is that person saying that? All right. Then if you realize that maybe there's some truth in, in, in what the person is saying, then your response could be your intention. What's your intention? Oh, how can we help that person improve? All right. That's, that's a good intention. Or you even know that what the person said is actually not true, or you actually do not know. Then you could either remain silent, don't, don't add fuel to the fire, right? or you, you, you could say, well, actually, I don't really know that, that person, which is a fact. But if you do know that, that person, and there are occasions when you have dealt with him or her, and there are certain good points that you remembered, there's literally nothing wrong for you to say, oh, actually, it's, I'm surprised that, you know, from what you said, because from that little experience, or interaction I have with that person, it was quite different, you know, he or, he or she, you know, actually helped me in this, blah, 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 and so So you can always highlight that positive one. Now, this person who complains cannot say that's not true because that's what you experience. You see, so in that way, you actually dilute. You actually dilute the situation. But your intention is, is always clear. Your intention is always clear, right? To create harmony rather than disharmony. So we always ask ourselves, what is our purpose? Right? Do we want to create harmony in society, in people that we meet with? Or do we want to create disharmony? Which is more exciting, disharmony, isn't it? Well, you see, see, people quite, quite quarrel, right? Okay, so, so this is one. Okay, let's look at, the, look at the next one. You see, uh, again, this, this, this starts with weak points, right? When not asked, reveals his own weak points. Then he talks about himself. To say nothing of when asked. If pressed with questions, he speaks of his own weak points in full, without omission. So he's prepared to, to tell you what is his, his weaknesses. He's not afraid of it. Right? Now, if he's able to do that, it doesn't mean that he depreciates him, himself. It's just that he has self-confidence, that he knows that these are his weak points. Maybe by talking to you, you can tell him how he can improve himself. So you can see it in that way. When asked, he does not reveal his own good points to say nothing when unasked. Right? So you, after talking, you don't say, hey, why you never ask me what are my good points? <laughs> you, 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 are not, you, know, you don't go to that, to that extent. Right? If pressed with questions, he speaks of his good points not in full. He just said, well, you know, you know, because of good conditions, you know, I'm able to do this, because of good mentors. You, you find that successful people who are very humble, humility, they always attribute their success not just to themselves. They say, yeah, why? You, you ask someone, why are you so successful? He, he never said, yeah, because I'm great. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the master of the universe. <laughs> he, he wouldn't say that, isn't it? Right? He will always attribute it to, to maybe sometimes the wife, sometimes his, uh, his mentors. You know? So people will always talk about that. All right? So you always attribute your success. In Buddhism, we all say, yeah. I'm successful because I've got good conditions. You know, I create those con conditions. I'm thankful. You know, so like in my career, I'm always very thankful because, you know, I'm, I work for so many different companies, I, I, uh, and every company that I work with, you know, the the very senior people have always been very kind to me, and I try to make sure that they are also very kind to other people, and I try to be kind to them, of course. You know, so as. So if you treat people well, people actually treat you, treat you well. You know, like I always re remember this, this uh, PA to the chairman. You know, this chairman is a, is a very, very, um, is a bit like the Donald Trump type. You know, so you you you've got to be very careful when you see him. So I always ask this PA of his, hey, how's the weather today? Uh? And he and, and she will tell me, hey, today uh, today I've got Nimbus clouds uh, <laughs> Wait till you have Cyrus clouds. You know, Nimbus clouds, rain clouds. And I'm always thankful to her, you know. And today we are we're still in touch. You know, she's no more with the company. She's she's doing her own freelance, uh, you know, work. So you know, I've always been fortunate in that. Sense. And of course, I also attribute to 
a good store of uh, past good karma, but should, you should never take for granted the good karma that you have. You never take it for granted. All right? If you have good karma, all right, then you continue to create more new karma. Our late chief, I always remember his, his, his advice. You know, he said, for us to succeed in life, we need punya. Punya means uh, merits. Uh, merit, all right? Okay, so that's the topic for another talk, how to create good car, good <laughs> merits. All right, all right so uh, this is from the Sapurisa Sutta. Now, Sapurisa means, um, again, this is one of those words very difficult to translate. Sapurisa means someone who is uh, wholesome, someone who is complete, someone who is good. All right, so you find that this applies not only to monks and nuns, it applies to everybody. And I think this applies to all of us, isn't it? So, so, so I thought this one correlates very well with what I mentioned earlier. So you, you can read this discourse is in the uh, book, book of uh, Gradual Sayings, Book of Four. 4.73 means uh, Book of Gradual Sayings. This is, uh, this is Book of Four. They yeah, actually, I think, what, 11 books? I think 11 or 12, I can't remember. 11, right? And they are <coughs> Sutta 73. So there are four things, <laughs> four things that makes a good person. So you can read it. Okay? So, so for us, we want to cultivate a, a positive mind, we want to transform our, our, our mind, we want, to, we want our mind to be a Velcro for, for wholesome, skillful things, and a Teflon for unwholesome and unskillful things. What should we do? So I think from the, so now it goes more specifically to the, 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 the Buddhist approach, not what Rick Hansen has to say, but what, what, what the Buddha has said in the teachings is number one, to have right views, right effort, and right mindfulness. All right? So let's, let's look, look at the, these three things. Now, all these three comes from where? The Eightfold Path, isn't it? Right? So I always believe, you know, whatever Dharma teachings that you, are, that you go to, all right, as long as the, 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 whoever the teacher is or the speaker is, goes back to the Eightfold Path, then you know you're on the right track. Right? If somebody comes and talks to you, suddenly, you know, out of Eightfold Path, you just need to practice two is good enough then I think you better be very, very careful. All right. Because the Eightfold Path is derived from the Four Noble Truths. Isn't it? Yeah, you know, just now, a very interesting anecdote I want to share with you. You know, just now I told you that recently, through Richard Solomon's work, we discovered the Gandhari scriptures, right? And one of the questions that was asked of Professor Solomon is, uh, in the Gandhari scriptures, do you come across anything like the instead of four noble truths, like five noble truths? <laughs> or three noble truths? So Richard Solomon said, Well, you know, I've looked through the Gandhari manuscript. Everywhere is still the four noble truths. <laughs> so which act or in, in the Agamas, you know, you know, the, the Chinese Agamas, right? They always talk about the four, four noble truths. When Master Singin, the late Master Singin, when he teach, he talks about the four noble truths from humanistic. The Fo Kong Shan uh, master who passed away. When uh, Thich Nhat Hanh talks, he also talks about Four Noble Truths. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he loves to talk on the Four Noble Truths. Achan Sumido comes to Malaysia, one of his earlier trips, he spent his talk talking about Four Noble Truths. So, as long as you ground yourself in the Four Noble Truths, you can't go wrong. Then you know that you are within the Buddha's authentic teachings. Authentic. Because today, authenticity is very important. There are many people out there who, who claims to be gurus, to be masters, you know, lamas, you know, so you've got to be very, very careful. So that's why yoni so manasekara is very important. All right, so always look at the, uh, this, it goes back to the Four Noble Truths. So here, this is from the Eightfold Path, yeah, the right views, right effort, and right mindfulness. Okay, let's look at what, what, what is meant by, when we talk about right views. <coughs> okay. So when we talk about right views, the best way is for us to have wise reflection. All right? We wise reflection and unwise reflection. Now, what is wise reflection? Now, in wise reflection, in other words, we reflect. Is something that is done, is it conducive to one's happiness or not one's happiness? When, when you think about it, when you say it, when you do it. Does it lead to happiness? Does it lead to well-being? Does it not lead to happiness? Does it not lead to well-being? One source of identification is what the Buddha said in the scriptures. Right? Then you refer back to the scriptures, what the Buddha says. The other authentication is your, your own experience. All right? When you say something hurtful to other people, all right? does the people enjoy it? Does people like it? They don't. When somebody speaks something hurtful to you, do you like it? 
You don't. So that being the case, would you want to, would you want to do that? You do not want to do that, isn't it? So the, the Buddha gave many teachings. In fact, one of the most wonderful teachings he gave was to his, uh, to his very son, Rahula. I think the son was only about seven or eight years old. In the Ambala Tika Rahulo Vada Sutta. It's a very long name. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You can't remember that. All right. So this discourse was given to Rahula. And, it, and the Buddha told Rahula, this is about lying. So from the Buddhist perspective, to speak untruth all right, is, is considered not a wholesome, not a skillful method. So he told uh, his son Rahula in this discourse uh, <clears throat> that whatever thoughts that you have, whatever words that you want to say, whatever actions that you want to do, always remember, before you do it, while you are doing it, and after you have done it. You see? Uh, this is Buddha telling a seven-year-old or eight-year-old. <laughs> um, some of you cannot appreciate that, right? So he said that whatever thoughts that we have, whatever words that we want to say, whatever actions that we want to do, before this is done, all right? Before you, you, you do it, think about whether does it lead to one's happiness and happiness of others. And then while doing it, if while you are doing it, you know, you, you know it is skillful, you know it's, it's wholesome, you continue doing it. But if it's not, immediately you, 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 you stop it. Right? And then after you have done it, then you reflect. What I said, or what I was thinking, or what I did, was it skillful? Did it help? Did it not help? Then you reflect. So the three, the, the, the three time frames of past, the present, and the future. Right? So all those are actually very practical ad advice, isn't it? All right? Correct? So it's something that we can actually uh, <clears throat> apply in our everyday life. Okay? So that's, that's one. So that's, that's called having wise reflections. And I think one of the best examples is to read this discourse the Buddha gave to his son, Rahula. Right? Again, I repeat, if you are interested, it's called Ambalatika. Ambalatika Rahulo. Rahula from the word Rahula. Sutta. Well, you can just Google Rahula Suttas. I think the, the word will, will, will come up. Rahula Sutta. Well, there are many Rahula Suttas. <laughs> this is the lesser discourse on Rahula Sutta. This, uh, this is the word Ambalatika. Right? So, to me, I think that is a very practical guide in our life. Whatever you want to say, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to, to, uh, to, to, to well, before you, whatever you think about, always, always ask the implications. Now, why is this so? This is linked to another very important part of, uh, of right views, is to understand that every action has consequences. Now, this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's favorite expression. All actions have consequences. All actions have consequences. So you have to remember that. All right? If you remember, that means you're mindful of that, doesn't it? <laughs> so mindful doesn't mean that, that only maybe once in a year, you know, you go to a BGF retreat, and then you're mindful. <laughs> right? Once you're not in the retreat, you're no more mindful. So mindfulness is not that. Mindfulness is actually every, every moment of, of our life. Right? That's why I always fascinated when the late thing your hand says what is my mindfulness when you're eating you're mindful when you're washing dishes you're, you're you're mindful when you're sweeping the floor you're mindful so basically we try to uh, turn every action in in our daily life into a mindful activity right not easy but worth a try isn't it worth a try okay the buddha never said that it's easy remember i said at the beginning the the, the spiritual path is like it's like you know climbing up, like, like, like water going upstream. <laughs> it's not, not easy. Right? I think it would be, um, it would be, a sim it would be too simple to, uh, you'd be a, um, naive right? to, to, to say that, oh, you know, the spiritual practice is easy. You know? No, no, it, it's not. But it, it is beneficial, right? So there's wise reflection and unwise re reflection. Okay? So karma, the law of karma. So every action has its consequences. So always remember that. And what are these actions? Right? So this is where karma is. Karma or kamma. K-A-R-M-A, for those who are new. Karma, K-A-R-M-A or K-A-M-M-A. They're, they're the same. It's just that one is in Pali, one is in Sanskrit, right? So for an action or a thought to be considered karma, what must be there? What is the most important ingredient there? Huh? 
intention, isn't it? Intention or your motivation. Intention or your motivation, right? So that's why in, uh, you can read this in another this, this course. How, how do we know that the Buddha said, said that? So you want to get the source. The source is another discourse. The Buddha gave is called the Nibedika Sutta. Right? Nibedika Sutta. So you look at the Nibedika Sutta, the Buddha was very explicit that intention, O oh monks, he said, is karma. Right? His intention is karma. Is karma. So we must remember that. So what is our intention? Right? The Tibetans like to use the word, what is our motivation? When we do something, what motivates us? Is it a motivation based on anger? For example, you can do dana, you can give out of anger. You can give out of fear. You can give out of greed. Thinking if I give this, hey, so I, I, I give this, next, next time I want something back easier. You know? <laughs> right? Or you give, you make a donation to, to the government department hoping that you know, the, the enforcement officer will not come. <laughs> so that's a form of, it, technically it's giving, isn't it? Is giving, you're giving something, but that giving is diluted, is polluted. That's giving is polluted. Because that giving is based on either fear or greed or even anger. You know, when, as I always give the example, you know, when, when you are having a nice plate of your meal, you know, in the food court, and then here walks a beggar who has not been, who has not taken his shower for perhaps a week, and you could smell him from, you know, from 10 feet away, you know, before you come nearer, you just throw 50 cents coin at him, you say, please take it and go away, don't come near to me. <laughs> You're giving, isn't it? You're giving him money, right? But it's given out of anger, out of fear, that maybe he come too near, you know, you may get infected. So, our thoughts, so the Buddha said, all those are karma. So, we create all sorts of karma. So, we got to be, uh, be, 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 have the right views that, from the Buddhist teachings, he says that the wholesome karma will result in wholesome results. Unwholesome karma results in unwholesome results. And wholesome karma and unwholesome karma result in unwholesome, uh, re re result in karma that is wholesome and unwholesome. Right? And of course, there's a f the, the last one, neither wholesome nor unwholesome karma leads to result. There is neither wholesome nor unwholesome. Now, the last part, I think we need another another talk. <laughs> All right, that, that's a separate one. Okay, so so basically, is is about that. Okay, so types of reflection. So we use wise re reflection, and that is where right views is. So the the Buddha says, just as the 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 the, the dawning of the morning is the sun, the dawning of the morning is the sun. So the dawning of the Dharma is actually right views. Is right is right view. So you don't have right views. It's very very difficult. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Oh. Ah, so well, this is just an ex explanation. This is wise reflection. So results in right view of the nature of existence. Results in wrong view of the nature of existence. Okay. So what is wise? So as I said, if you are interested in what the Buddha meant by yoni so manasekara, uh, there's another dis discourse, which is the second dis discourse in the book of Middle Length Sayings in the Majjhima Nikaya. The name of the discourse is very easy to remember. Sabha Sutta. Sabha means all. What is the all? <laughs> all right. So the not not Sabha Sama. Sabha. S A B B A. Sabha Sutta. Sabha. Ah. No, no, Majima Nikaya too. Majima Nikaya. Uh, Majima, not, not, not Samhita. Okay, so that's the second discourse of the Majima Nikaya. Okay, so you can look at that and then you can get more. So, results in right view of the nature of existence, results in wrong view of the nature of existence. Now, the, the, the next one is mindfulness, isn't it? Alright, so in Buddhism, we, we said we have to be mindful. We've got to learn to be mindful. Now, what, what does it mean to be mindful? Alright. Uh, to be mindful of our actions, right? So you have got uh, wise attention. So wise attention must be linked to uh, mindfulness, clear comprehension, and ardency. Ardency or atapi, right? So these are the, the three words that you find in the Satipatthana Sutta, right? Those of you who who have uh, started on meditation. So mindfulness. So these are the, the three terms. Let me just go on. 
Okay, so one is mindful behavior. So this is, an, this is one, one example for us to be mindful. Now this is uh, not from the Pali text, this is from uh, Atisha, a Bodhisattva garlands of, of gems. I think there are about 32 verses, right? Not as many as Dhammapada, right? This, this is a, also a wonderful text if you can, uh, you can Google it. He says, when in the midst of many, let me keep a check on my speech. But when remaining alone, let me keep a check on my mind. All right. So this is a very powerful statement, I think. Uh, in the Tibetan tradition, these are called piti saying. Piti, not, not, not the piti, the kasian piti. P-I-T-H-Y. <laughs> piti. Short but very powerful sayings. All right. So for example, there are, as I said, there are maybe like 32 verses. I cannot remember all the 30, 32 verses in the Bodhisattva's Garlands of Gems by Atisha. I always remember this, 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 this verse. So this verse reminds me that when I'm in the midst of many people, I must always be mindful of what I say. Because that's very important, isn't it? But when I'm alone, when there's nobody for me to talk to, what, I should, what should I be mindful of? My own mind. Right? My own mind. Because what goes on in my mind, you do not know. You do not know. But only I know. <laughs> okay? Right? So, and I think Atisha hits it, hits the, the nail on the, you know, on the head. <laughs> right. That when you are in the midst of many people, you know, sometimes, you know, when we must always check our, 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 our speech, when we are alone, we always check our mind. So that's been one of the characteristics of a mindful behavior, all right, mindful behavior. Okay, so to, today's talk is not about mindfulness, but I just want to share with you that the uh, Actually, mindfulness is something that we can, we should apply in our everyday life. So it's not like when you're in retreats. Why do we go for retreats? Or why do we go for, say, meditation sessions? Meditation sessions, I always find that it's, a, it's like a, to recharge, to recharge your battery, you know, right? But you don't, but you, you don't need to recharge. Once the battery is full, when your iPhone is full, you don't need to recharge it, right? It, it works, right? But after a while, it, it goes off, doesn't it? Right? Then you've got to recharge. So there are many ways you can recharge your battery. Going for retreats, uh, maybe even offering dana, you know, when you meet up with, uh, with monks, when you meet up with teachers, when you do dharma work. You know. Like when I share dharma talks, when, I, when Bobby or whoever in Babs or in Nalanda, when they ask me to give a dharma talks, I always think, actually, who benefits the most? I think I benefit the most. I don't know about you. <laughs> Why? Because for me to be able to stand in front of you and say something uh, not nonsensical, <laughs> all right? I, I have to read up, I have to contemplate, I have to reflect, and more important, I have to see whether I'm able to practice that. So I think I benefit maybe more than anybody else. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, so I always like to encourage people to share the, share the Dhamma. But you only share what you know, right? You cannot share what you do not know. <laughs> That's very important, yeah? Okay? Okay, so, so this, this, I just want to show this to you so that you can uh, take note of the importance of what did. So I just want to co conclude and then maybe leave time for Q&A. Uh, so it's very important to keep examining your mind at all times and be aware of what occurs in it. So we have this habit of criticizing others Right? I think in one of the, uh, an, another discourse, uh, mm, I can't remember the name of the discourse, where, where, where the, again, it got a very long name, right? where, the, where the Buddha was, was saying, you know, instead of criticizing someone, you, you critique the action. Yeah, so you, uh, I, I, Arana Vibhanga Sutta, yes, ah, very good. We, we, we came, the memory came back at the same time. Arana Vibhanga Sutta. Yeah. So that's, that's the Buddha. So you see, a lot of all this, the Buddha actually gave very uh, practical uh, advice. We, we, uh, Arana Vibhanga Sutta. Okay? So we have this habit of criticizing others. Right? But we should criticize that action. Right? Um, we are very good at pointing out their faults. But we have a hard time being aware of our own flaws. Okay? This one. 
So examining the faults of others will not benefit anyone and only leads to more disturbing emotions, blocking our path to liberation. Now having said that, uh, I, I think this question was also asked and, and, um, and I think Peno Rinpoche was asked this question and once he, he said, does it mean that then we don't even tell someone that he has got a fault? So the, the answer is no. Because if you have got the, of course in the Tibetan tradition, they call it the Bodhicitta Hat, you know, you, or the Bodhisattva kind of approach. And then if you know that someone has said something or had done something wrong, and you just keep quiet, so I keep noble silence and I just smile. <laughs> no, you, you actually go to that guy, but with good intention, with good motivation, to be a Kalyana Mita, to be a good friend, to try to tell him, to try to convince him that, hey, this is not something you should do. You should not do that. That's not a very positive thing. So, but you, 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 you say that, so again, like Arana Vibhanga Sutta, perhaps you criticize that action. You criticize that action. He said that action is not, not a very skillful action. You know, that action leads to suffering of the other person. You know, maybe we should, maybe, you know, you start by saying, why do you want to do it? You know, maybe you shouldn't do it. All right, they are, you know, that is, is not good. So, so you, have, you say that, but with good intention. Now, if that person refused to follow you, he said, you no, know, you're talking rubbish. What else can, can, can you do? Do you get upset and, and start cursing him and say, like that, you sure go to hell and like that. I, you know? <laughs> then you start describing the 16 hells, you know, how many which hell you go. I mean, does it serve any purpose? You think he'll, 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 he'll believe you? He's not going to believe you either, isn't it? So you, you, you know that sometimes it's beyond you, but you've already done, done your part. Right? So you, you can be concerned, you can be, uh, you know, I always man mentioned this, I think even shared with you previously, you know, this uh, Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey said in, in life, after everything, there are two areas. Areas of influence, area of concern <laughs> in, in, in life. If you look at it in our life, areas of interest, sorry, areas of influence, areas of concern. You can be concerned about many things, but sometimes you have no influence in it, right? I'm sure you're, all of us, you know, as long as we understand compassion and all this, we are very concerned about the suffering, the killing in Gaza, right? Right, okay, so we are all concerned, but do you have an actual influence on it? If you have, okay, you do, do something. I think it's more than just not eating McDonald's, you know? I think it's much more than that, you know? Maybe you should stop using waste, you know? You should stop flying Boeing, you know, isn't it? There are many more you can do, but it's a practical. Right? So there are other ways we, we, we can do it. Okay, so, so that's why Yoni so Manesekara becomes so, so, so critical in that sense. Okay, right. So it doesn't, so we can try to help someone. We can try to tell someone that whatever that action has been done is not uh, beneficial, not useful. And if the person can seize the, um, the benefit of it, that's wonderful, that's, that's great, you've done your job, okay? Yeah, so I just want to conclude with uh, one teaching here by Panorin, Panorin Pache. Some of you may know if you are in the Tibetan tradition. Panorin Pache used to be the head of the Nyingma, the Nyingma, yeah, Ning, Ningma, yeah. So, but he has passed away, uh, passed away two years, long, long, quite some, some time. So this is what he said, but you know, he said, it is very important to watch your own mind and train in subduing and reducing your own disturbing emotions, right? The, the Tibetan tra tradition, they use the word disturbing emotions, afflictive emotions, negative emotions, to refer to what in the Pali tradition we would us usually call uh, uh, unwholesome akusala, Right? Unwholesome thoughts, unwholesome deeds, unwholesome actions. Right? So they use this, this, this word. So analyze your mind, constantly watch your thoughts. Like what Atisha said, when in the midst of others, check your speech. When alone, check your mind. Okay? So analyze your mind, constantly watch your thoughts, recognizing whether they are positive or negative, whether they are wholesome or unwholesome. Right? You remember just now I mentioned, the Buddha gave this instruction to Rahula, to his very own son. Okay, so we could use that as a guideline. So whatever thoughts that arise in our mind, all right? Uh, recognizing whether they're positive or negative and become aware of your faults, okay? If you constantly observe yourself and analyze your thoughts, you will be able to eventually tame your mind, right? 
So we use, we like to use this analogy of the mind, like a monkey mind, isn't it? All right, the monkey mind. So the monkey mind can be developed, can be tamed, all right? And, uh, and, and also from the Buddhist perspective, even from the Pali tradition, the, the very first verse of the Anguttara Nikaya, the, the, the book of gradual saying, I think the first sentence is, is about sabasara, about the luminous mind. He says that our mind is luminous, but it becomes uh, defiled because of adventitious thoughts, adventitious thoughts that comes in. Right? So basically our mind is, is luminous, but uh, Rick Hansen calls it at a resting stage. <laughs> Because the, 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 the good stuff are all resting down there. So we need to cultivate it. We need to cultivate it. Alright? So, but of course, in the Mahayana, in the Tibetan tradition, they thought of Buddha nature. Yeah? The Tathagata Garba, <laughs> the Buddha nature. Not so much mentioned in the Pali or the Theravada. But, as I said, in the first verse of the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha did say that we have a luminous mind. When the mind is luminous, it can shine through, just like wisdom can shine through. Right? So, so because of that, we can, train our, we can train our mind. And why is that so? Because the mind, our thoughts, they are not permanent, isn't it? Our thoughts, are our thoughts permanent? They are not permanent. They are not permanent. And His Holiness, the Dalai Lama says that the wonderful thing about our mind, the wonderful thing about impermanence is that our negative thoughts are also impermanent. Because our negative thoughts, our disturbing thoughts, are impermanent, we can change them. Right? We can change them. So when you look at it from that perspective, impermanence or anicca is not something negative, not something pessimistic. Some people say Buddhism or everything is impermanent. You know? <laughs> right? But if you look at it from a different angle, that impermanence is actually very positive. Because things change. If your business is not doing well today, Things will change. I, we just had our business meeting uh, two days ago, and we, we thought that we're not going to meet our revised budget. But through the what my CFO showed us on the screen is probably we we're going to hit our targets. <laughs> yeah. So you know, so things change. You know, four, five, six months ago we, we we thought we're not going to meet our targets because things are so so gloomy. Things are so negative, but things change. You, you, you get what I mean? So we can always be very, well, I'm not sure optimistic is a word, but realistic is, is a proper word. Realistic. Okay. Okay. So we, then we're able to tame our So in other words, we can tame our mind. If you can't tame our, our, our mind, then I think the Buddha would have spent 45 years trying to teach us how to tame our mind. He, he could have e easily just retired, kept to himself, you know. Uh, enjoying the bliss of Nibbana, isn't it? But he stayed back for 45 years, right? That's the longest religious ministry, right? Remember, Prince Siddhartha became the Buddha. Uh, he was only, what, age 35, right? So many of you have missed the age already, yeah? except the young ones, right? <laughs> well, I've definitely missed it. <laughs> so, but for the next 45 years, from age 35 to, what, 80? Of course, the Chinese says he died at 81. The Chinese will add one more year, right? So, yeah, he, he taught for 45 years because he, he believed that we can actually improve, we can change. Okay, so that's, I think that's a very positive uh, uh, thing that the Buddha did. Okay, oh, that's a, the last one. Okay, so I just want to end here. I think it's about 5 to 11. So we end at 11.15, isn't it? Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, please pre prepare to, to share. Like, as I said, not necessarily questions, you have some comments, you have some inputs, something you'd like to add on, you know, please. Uh. Thank you very much, Brother Benny, for that very insightful talk. So, uh, brothers and sisters, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you.